So the last speaker of today's seminar is uh, Mustafa Mir. Mir. And uh, Mustafa received his uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from this university. He also received his master's degree here. And he's currently finishing his PhD in electrical engineering. And he is advised by Dr. Popescu. So um, his research has focused on using novel optical methods to answer pressing biological questions. And today he will be talking about quantitative phase imaging for investigating, investigating living cellular systems. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Thomas, for the introduction and opportunity to present here. Uh, a lot of the work I'll be showing might be uh, familiar to some of you because uh, my advisor, Professor Popescu, gave a talk here just two weeks ago, so you might uh, recognize some of the work from there. Uh, but my talk is uh, going to focus on this new technology that we've developed in the quantitative light imaging lab here at Beckman uh, called quantitative phase imaging and how uh, some applications of this uh, technology. And my goal here is to illustrate to you the importance of this technology in the life sciences uh, by showing the applications that answer fundamental questions in biology. So uh, I'd like to start at the very beginning to put this into context. And uh, that's at the beginning of the fields of microscopy and cell biology, which is in the 17th century when Anton von Leeuwenhoek used the earliest bright microscopes to first observe uh, living cells and other microorganisms. Uh, and really, these two fields have evolved together over the past few centuries, uh, and they really have developed hand in hand. Uh, but the problem uh, since the beginning with imaging light cells is that they're really thin, really <coughs> small, transparent objects. And what that means is that if you just shine light through it, they absorb very little light, and so you don't get much contrast in your image. So this is an image of a rat hippocampal neuron, and you can see that you don't get, really get much contrast. So we like to call these objects phase objects because although they do not attenuate the intensity of the light, the refractive index inside the cell or the density of the con uh, non aqueous content inside the cell is slightly higher than the background. So they impart a phase shift, which means the light takes slightly longer to go through the cell than the background. So uh, to address uh, this issue of contrast, there has, there's two major approaches, subdivisions basically. One is to use extrinsic or exogenous contrast agents which is uh, like stains, fluorescent uh, probes, and the other is endogenous contrast agents, which actually utilize this phase shift uh, and decouple this phase shift into the intensity information. And these are very popular methods, probably all of you are familiar with them, like phase contrast microscopy and DIC. Uh, the problem with all these methods is that they, they do give you a pretty picture and they provide you with contrast, but they don't actually tell you anything more about the information. All you get is what you see over here, that's it. So what we do in the lab, uh, which is why it's called quantitative phase imaging, is to actually measure this phase shift. And in the case of living cells, to give you an idea of how small this phase shift is, if I translate uh, the phase shift into the amount of time it takes the light to travel through the cell versus not, it comes down to a few femtoseconds, as you would imagine. So this measurement has to be extremely sensitive, and it has to be extremely stable to get any useful information out of it. Uh, so the way that the quantitative phase is actually measured is through interferometry. And in interferometry, what you do is you have basically two arms. One, in one arm you have your sample, you pass through that light through it. In the other arm you have your reference, which hasn't gone through the sample. And when, uh, and when you interfere them at your detector plane, and from the interference pattern of these two fields, you can extract this phase information. Now, uh, traditionally, uh, interferometry is done in an arrangement like this when these two arms are separated and traditionally it's done using highly coherent sources like lasers. And these cause several problems. Uh, the first uh, are due to the sources which are extremely coherent so they cause this effect called the speckle pattern which degrades the uh, background of the image so it reduces your spatial sensitivity. And the next is problems in stability which are, uh, come from uncorrelated noise in these two arms. So basically if uh, there's some fluctuations in the reference arm that aren't present in the sample arm, you can't, do, uh, you can't remove those from your data once you measure them. So you have this noise in your measurement. And since you're trying to measure this extremely small signal, this has a big effect on the quality of your final image. So the way we address this, uh, one of the ways we address this in our lab, we have several different uh, ways of doing this, is uh, spatial light interference microscopy, or we call it SLIM. And uh, basically in SLIM, uh, first, we use a white light source, so this has a shorter coherence length, so this removes the problem with the speckles. And second, uh, so the key thing you need to understand to uh, recognize how this works is that in 
any microscope image is basically an interference of the light that scattered off your sample and the light that passes through it unperturbed. So you have an interference between these two fields. And in any imaging system, if you look at the pupil plane or the back focal plane of your objective, these two fields are spatially separated. So now you can play with them. And what Zernike did in the uh, 50s, or actually in the 40s, uh, to invent phase contrast microscopy, is to put the unscattered field, shift the unscattered field by pi over 2 relative to the scattered field to generate this contrast. And what we do in SLIM is basically we project this back focal plane onto a liquid crystal phase modulator. And that's basically, as you tune the voltage on the liquid crystals, you can control the phase shift that you're imparting on the light. And uh, so we can use this to provide a controlled phase shift, delay the unscattered field relative to the scattered uh, field in a controlled manner. And if we do this enough times, we can solve for the quantitative phase. And the image you see over here now, this is a quantitative phase image where the colors actually correspond to the optical path line difference, or the phase shift which is how long it's taking the light to pass through each point in that image versus the background. So uh, with SLIM, uh, because these re reference and sample arms are not in overlaid, basically, they're right on top of each other, the noise effects don't matter. The, this background is extremely uniform, so we can measure this phase shift with sub-nanometer accuracy. And it turns out that in the case of uh, living cells, uh, if you take the surface integral of this phase, you get the dry mass. And if you translate the uh, sub-nanometer sensitivity to mass, we can measure changes in dry mass on the order of femtograms. And so all the applications I'm going to show you basically center around this idea of using the phase shift to measure dry mass and what we can do with that information. We have several other applications in the lab, but this is mostly what I have been working on. So the first application I'm going to show you is a very basic science application, which is actually measuring how single cells grow. And, uh, you might ask, OK, don't we know how this happens already? But uh, the problem is this is a really difficult engineering challenge. And that has actually been described as one of the last big unsolved problems in cell biology. And the open questions are very basic in some cases. Do single cells grow exponentially? Do they grow linearly? And the other more complicated questions are, how, do, uh, how is this mass growth actually regulated? How do cells decide to move from one part of the cell cycle to the next? And uh, evidence is slowly accumulating that the growth rate of the mass has, and a, the actual absolute mass value has a big effect on how cells choose to progress in the cell cycle. And so the problem is really difficult because cells are really small. They weigh in on the order of picograms. And on top of that, they only double their mass through the lifetime, and then they divide. So if you start off with a cell that weighs 4 picograms, it's going to grow to 8 picograms, divide back to 4. So you have very little range to work with. So you need, uh, you need actually femtogram sensitivity to even tell apart linear versus exponential growth. And on top of that, cells are come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They like to move around. So you need to have a method that addresses all of these problems. So this is what we can do with SLIM. Uh, what I'm showing you over here is uh, a 2.4 by 3.2 millimeter field of view uh, of a, a sample of human osteosarcoma cells that are uh, growing over five days. So there's, uh, from the image, there's two things to note that uh, this is actually a field of view that's stitched together of five separate images. Uh, or a five by five mosaic. And you can't even tell where the stitching is, even though we're not doing anything special, just putting them next to each other. So this is where the quantitative phase is important. Background is so uniform, you don't have to worry about actually stitching it. Second, over five days, our stability is extremely uh, good, so we can actually measure these fish, uh, uh, or the mass changes, this femtogram accuracy, over these five days. And uh, on the graph, what you're seeing is that on the, the black curve is basically showing the total dry mass of this field of view, plotted on this axis over here. And the red curve is showing the mean cell mass plotted on the red axis. And uh, interestingly, what you see is that the total dry mass continues to grow, but the mean cell mass levels off, indicating that there's some sort of a sort of homeostasis point that's been reached uh, in, the, uh, in the culture. So this is to illustrate the scales that we can measure. Uh, so to actually get into uh, deeper science questions, we first wanted to use the model organism. So we used E. coli, which is extremely well studied. And here, uh, in case you're wondering, uh, uh, E. coli cell weighs around 2 picograms. And uh, so this is a parent cell shown in black. It divides. It has two daughter cells, red and green. And over here, our sensitivity is about 1.9 femtograms. And the question over here was, do these cells grow exponentially or linearly? Because that has different implications for how this growth rate is uh, actually controlled. We found that they grow exponentially, which agrees well with previous studies. So this was kind of our sanity check, and then we wanted to move on to more complicated cells. So uh, one of the studies we did was 
uh, with those human osteosarcoma cells. And here the goal was to see how the growth rate changes in different parts of the cell cycle. And this is a very important question in cell biology is when do cells dis decide to divide, when do cells decide to go from the growth phase to the S phase and has implications in cancer, uh, cell developmental biology, and uh, you know, uh, therapeutics. And to actually address this question, we uh, use a fluorophore that uh, allows us to tell what part of the cell cycle the cell is in. So then we just measure our mass, we measure fluorescent at the same time, and we can split up our mass curves according to the growth phase. And uh, in this study, we basically found that um, conventional wisdom didn't hold true for these cells. Uh, more, more, if you open a cell biology textbook, you'll find that they'll say that all cells grow exponentially. But here, we found that the growth rate varies significantly between the different phases of the cell cycle. So to follow up on this work, we're looking at how uh, the growth rate changes that actually these uh, transition points between the phases. And this is a pretty uh, active area of work in many labs now. Uh, and now to actually give you a more concrete example, uh, kind of a, a practical application of this is to develop a breast cancer therapy assay. So I've shown you that we can measure single cells with this femtogram accuracy. So we can actually uh, get, say, a few cells from a patient and treat, uh, we have, say we get a bulk of a tumor, we break it up and we can test hundreds of different drugs simultaneously on some small samples because we can detect these changes with just a, a few cells. Uh, so here I'm showing a uh, breast cancer cell line in which uh, in the first one we treated with estrogen and the second one we treated with estrogen and then ICI which is an estrogen inhibitor. So estrogen causes the, cell, the growth rate of the cells to increase and the ICI goes and competitively binds with the estrogen receptor causing the growth rate uh, to fall back down. And we can uh, basically what I'm showing here is that we can actually measure this effect at the single cell level and as early as six hours in both cases which is uh, typically, uh, with the current technologies, it takes up to 24 hours, and you actually need a large number of cells. So this, uh, this has the potential uh, to act as an assay to, uh, to determine what is the best therapy for a particular patient, because you can test a large number of drugs on a small uh, sample size. Okay, so the last application I'm going to show you uh, extends this idea of me measuring mass a little bit further. And uh, this, I think, is the kind of the niche, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, a niche application for SLIM, uh, because there's no other uh, technology that can actually measure neurons in this manner. That is, what is the uh, uh, dry mass growth of neurons and how they're actually transporting mass. Uh, so here's the problem I'm trying to answer. So this is a, a culture of uh, human embryonic stem cell derived neurons. And they were frozen, and then we uh, shipped to us, we thawed them, and we plated them on this thing. So we randomly uh, plated them. And then six hours after plating, we started measuring. And what you see here is that initially, in the beginning of the movie, you have all these small isolated clusters. And they begin to send out these extensions. And by the end of the movie, you'll see that they all are connected. Smaller clusters begin to connect to form bigger clusters. And what you also notice is that the extensions actually don't go off in random directions. They're always actually uh, extending towards other clusters. So there's some sort of chemical sensing some kind of sort of gradient sensing which uh, allows these uh, cells to self-organize without any external cues. This was, uh, this was actually a recent finding by uh, uh, Dr. Millet in MNTL as well who showed that uh, unpatterned neurons have uh, spatially organized without any external cues. And so we also observed this behavior here. But now we measure the mass. So for us, doing this is really easy. We just integrate over the entire field of view and we have the mass. And what we found in the neurons is there's two distinct phases of growth. For the first 10 hours, they're busy sending out these extensions and connecting to each other, so we see an increase in the mass. But after the network has stabilized a little bit, the mass growth stops increasing and levels off. So our hypothesis here was that initially all the energy that the culture is uh, consuming is going towards sending out these extensions. But obviously the cells are still alive, so what are they using this energy for now? And the answer is to transport uh, materials between the cells. Uh, so here are two movies. So this is taken at zero hours, and this is one is taken at 24 hours. See, uh, uh, representative fields of use from that big thing you saw. And here you'll see that these um, extensions are wide. They're kind of going, coming back. Uh, and these will eventually form these mature, thin uh, things, uh, uh, extensions that we're used to coming out of neurons. So here you'll actually see that now that the network is established, you can see all sorts of 
uh, stuff moving back and forth in these extensions. These are actually vesicles that contain uh, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, uh, and we can observe this transport very clearly. Now the problem is how do we analyze this image? This is a continuous, uh, essentially you can look at this as a mass density field that's fluctuating over time. And that's how we treat it. So we uh, basically we're looking at this component of uh, these uh, uh, materials that are transported along the cell. And the way we look at this is that we analyze the dispersion relationship, basically how things are changing at different spatial frequencies relative to the temporal frequency. Um, and the, uh, any of you doing uh, imaging, anything to do with waves, you're very familiar with the dispersion relationship. And uh, essentially, that's what we do here. So we look at gamma versus Q. Gamma is the decay rate, and Q is the spatial frequency. And what we find is that at zero hours, so uh, I don't have time to give you a lot of background on this, but essentially, uh, what the math tells us is that if this relationship is linear, that means all the transport is dominantly directed. So they're actually consuming energy to send a, a particle from point A to point B. And if it's quadratic, that means the transport is diffusive. That means they're utilizing thermal energy for short-scale transport. And we see from 0 to 24 hours the shift from the deterministic, uh, do, uh, from the uh, diffusive dominant transport to deterministic dominant transport, basically uh, kind of confirming the hypothesis that the energy is moving away from extending these neurites to actually transporting uh, vesicles from point A to point B. And uh, so while I summarize, I'll show this movie in the background, which is uh, kind of what I'm currently working on, but I really like this movie. Uh, it's, uh, it's taken over uh, two weeks of, uh, this is a human embryonic stem cell derived neural progenitor cells that are differentiating into mature neurons over two weeks. So you will see the start off as kind of amorphous blob cell shaped things, and that by the end of two weeks, they look very neuronal. And the goal with this study is to basically apply those um, uh, the mass measurements and the transport measurements to c come up with differentiation markers. So you want to be able to look at a cell and say how far along uh, in, in its differentiation course it is. Um, and this is very important because in general differentiation protocols are uh, very, very, they're not very, uh, they don't achieve very homogeneous results. You get like 50% of the cells differentiating, others are not, and there's a lot of, so this is the big need in uh, stem cell biology is to be able to tell how far along uh, differentiated the cell is. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. And I'd like to acknowledge all my collaborators and other people in the lab who thought this work wouldn't be possible. And thank you for listening. Any questions? <laughs> so when you collect data from transformed cells or cancer cells, and you're, you're not really getting a baseline, how often do you check that with, with normal cells? Um, so the thing is, most cell lines, as you know, are cancer cell lines. Exactly. So what we're in, like, for example, in the cancer cell study, this question comes up a lot, too. We're basically looking at the difference in the therapy between the cancer cells. How does the therapy affect the growth of that specific cell line? It's sort of difficult to compare results from two different cell lines, so we really want to do that. Uh, but it's hard to come up with the right controls to do that. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, how does uh, SLIM, can you apply SLIM to a three-dimensional cell scaffold? Because in the human body, it's more representative of, of having a three-dimensional scaffold to mm -hmm. monitor cell behavior. So if you're proposing using um, this in like a series of parallel experiments with cancer cell types and applying a different drug on each one, wouldn't it make more sense to image them on a three-dimensional scaffold yeah. to <laughs> see if their behavior is actually more mimetic of what it would be in the body? So uh, there's a limit to how thick we can go, because it's designed for thin transparent objects, basically. Uh, so if it's really highly scattering, then this doesn't work very well. But even with the breast cancer work I showed, they, do, they are forming clumps. And we've done some tests with uh, some uh, three-dimensional scaffolds, but we haven't really progressed too far with that. I don't think this would be the best technology for uh, thick 3D samples. But this can be used for tomography, so we can, we can measure single cells in 3D very well and actually get the refractive index at each point. Uh, but for that, you probably want uh, more low coherence. Maybe uh, that's, uh, maybe close down the numerical aperture of uh, the condenser or, or the uh, objective, so we have larger depth of field, so we're integrating over uh, a thicker sample. Okay, well, that was it.
Wij zijn vreemd, we staan voor ons, hoor.